first. There was the NES Mini, then there was the SNES Mini. Well, actually, before that came a load of loads of, like, really crappy at games Mega Drives. Anyway, let's forget about all that and let's just concentrate on the C64 Mini. Plugs into your TV via included HDMI cable. AC adapter not included. Why do they keep doing that these days? Please, just give us the ability to power the thing we've bought. I know we've all got a million phone chargers, but you know, we use them all the time, and probably somebody's using them to charge their phone. Anyway, the C64 Mini then. Yeah, so this is based on the Commodore 64, the uh, world's best-selling home computer, which has now been reborn as such as it is, but only reborn for people seven years or older. So, you will notice it is called the C64 Mini and not the Commodore 64 Mini. There is no mention of Commodore anywhere on this because that was not involved in the licensing deal, I would imagine. You'll also spot a Competition Pro joystick with a lot of extra buttons, but we'll get on to that. 64 games included. See what they've done there? Yes, they've tied it in like. So it comes in a really nice box. My goodness, does it ever. Look, and it says the C64.com and it has a huge HDMI uh, trademark on it. So, you know, what more do you want out of life? From Retro Games Limited in conjunction with Cloanto. I didn't realise that. They're the guys who did um, Amiga Forever aren't they? Which was like a sort of workbench uh, stroke win UAE emulator bundle where you could basically emulate the Commodore Amiga legally. Anyway, that's not relevant. We need to look at features like high definition output at 720p via HDMI. Is that 720p technically HD? Ah, good enough. Pixel perfect display with US stroke Europe display modes and CRT filter options. If you don't know, um, the old Commodore 64 back in the day, released in the uh, early 80s, um, you had a completely different uh, sort of look, whether it was in America or in Europe, and not particularly because of anything inside the computer. It's more to do with the fact our televisions worked at a different hertz level. So, um, yeah, when you emulate them, sometimes games are a bit squished, sometimes games a bit aren't. Unless you can choose. That's nice. Save game function, bloody useful. We could have done one of those back in the day. Two USB ports. Plug in a USB keyboard and use as a home computer with C64 Basic. Yep, that means the keyboard on it isn't real, although you will see why when we get it out. Or add a second joystick for two-player games. Yes, you can buy one of these separately. You probably won't want to, but we'll get onto that. Support software updates via USB flash drive. Mm -mm. Nice. Right, we'll have a look at that last. Included uh, C64 mini computer. That's quite important. Uh, C64 joystick. <coughs> Notice they haven't said Competition Pro anywhere. HDMI cable, USB power supply cable, 64 games pre-installed, and instruction manual. Uh, that's all we've bought it for, really. Uh, right. 64 classic retro games included. We'll come back to these, but they've uh, listed some of the better ones at the top here. There's Armour Light from uh, good old Thalamus. Thalamus, as well as being the uh, part of the brain that sends on sensory and motor signals, the cerebral cortex. I think it regulates sleep as well, if I remember correctly. Anyway, it was also a company that made Commodore 64 games, and they made really bloody good ones. Really technically impressive games. Very good people, um, Thalamus, for such things. Look, it even says so there. I have remembered it correctly, with their weird logo of a weird face. There's Boulder Dash, which is an absolute Commodore 64 classic California games released on many, many Many systems. Still good fun, very good C64 version. Creatures, I don't understand, right? Because Creatures is a good game. It's very overrated, I felt. But Creatures 2 is bloody fantastic. But it hasn't got Creatures 2 and it's only got Creatures 1, which is a disappointment. I mean, it's all right, but it's no Creatures 2, is it? Impossible Mission 2, one of those games I always think of when anyone mentions the Commodore 64. Nebulous, which, well... Hmm, yeah, Nebulous. Had an interesting graphical effect, but bleh, not a very good game. Nodes of Yezod is interesting, because uh, I always uh, think more of the ZX Spectrum for Nodes of Yezod, but there we go. Paradroid. Hey, now that's another one of the games that springs to mind when you think of the C64. Robin of the Wood. Not so much. This is one of those weird, very atmospheric, but um, kind of a little bit dull explore maps. Never got on with it. Speedball 2. Not a bad version, but not the best version by a long shot. Spin Dizzy. I never liked Spin Dizzy. It's like Marble Madness, but unnecessarily hard. Never got into it. Iridium, bloody fantastic. I think that's one of the first Commodore 64 games I played. And my goodness, I was impressed. And you've even got full Commodore 64 basics. So you can write 10 print Dixons are shit 
20 go to 10 run and then watch the guy in Dixons chase you out of the store although that would involve going back in time and finding a branch of Dixons because I think they're all called Curry's PC World now or something anyway let's see what we've got in the box um, I should point out this model was very kindly sent to me by the makers of the C64 Mini and because I'm an absolute idiot I had one in pre-order and forgot to cancel it so I ended up buying one as well I think this is the one I bought I can't remember they both look very similar, for obvious reasons. Right, inside, the pretty box stuff continues. Very much so, in fact. Uh, the nice lines, see? They really have got the packaging down to an art on this, which is a quite an important part when it's something for sort of collector people. We like a nice box, don't we? And inside, ba -ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba, look at this. You can take this out, look. And there's all guff behind it like wires. We don't care about that. Let's get rid of the boring stuff first. Micro USB cable, HDMI cable, and again, even the manual, look, they've printed like the really old C64 stuff. Mm. If you don't remember what the old C64 manuals look like, they looked a bit like this. There, I sorted that out. Right, the unit itself then, let's get this out of the way, and peel out the C64 Mini. Oh, it looks like one of the old bread bin C64s, as we called them. Obviously, I don't have one of those to hand just to show you. Oh, wait, yes, I do. I'm Ashens. Whoop, here's one. Here's my old bashed up one. Bought it second hand. It looks like it's been through the digestive tract of a goat. <clears throat> also, there's the number four I had to replace. Look, it's a different colour. Anyway, as you can see, you can't complain about how exact that likeness is. The only difference really is they haven't got the weird little um, shape uh, pictures on the side of the keys. They've only printed on the top of them. And the Commodore key, which I shall demonstrate to you there, has now been replaced by the more copyright friendly the C64 key. Yeah, it's a shame. These buttons do not push down. They are a solid lump. It would be completely and totally unusable because <laughs> it's far too bloody small due to the design of the keys on the old Commodore 64 if they were real so I don't blame them for not completely wasting their own money and time by making them work but it is a shame in a way I mean maybe if you had really thin fingers you could have a go at it I don't know so not much in the way of ports there's HDMI there's power in there's a shiny sticker and there's two USB ports and a reset button, and that's your lot. It just automatically turns on when you plug it in, like, which is understandable. Now, while we're on the subject of uh, keyboards, I should point out that there is an on-screen keyboard you can access using the joystick. It is a massive faff, but it means you don't have to necessarily plug a USB keyboard in for quick keyboard stuff. But to be honest, if you're using the keyboard on this, you're probably gonna be using it quite a bit. So, mm, so the problem we have, only two USB ports, but we shall come back to that because I want to have a look at the joystick now. <gasps> because the joystick is a very important part of this, it's obviously connected via USB, as one would expect. Um, and it is obviously based on a Competition Pro. I don't have one of those handy to show you. Oh, yes, I do. I'm Ashens. Whoop! Micro switches. See, this is a very old and knackered one. But good old clicky clacky micro switches. No such thing on this, I'm afraid. I'll be honest, I was never a Competition Pro man anyway. I preferred the PowerPlay Cruiser or the Zipstick if necessary. But uh, unfortunately, this is entirely leaf switch. See, nothing tactile. Load of extra buttons, which uh, can be used in games, because some games would require you to press a key on the keyboard, and now you can map it onto this, which is a better experience. But I'm going to be honest, this thing's a bit shitty. It really, really is. Um, it sort of feels crappy and nasty. Um, it doesn't help you in the games. And remember, Commodore 64 games, my god, they took no prisoners. Many of them were, frankly, unnecessarily overly difficult. And yeah, it doesn't help when you've got slightly crappy key, um, joystick going on, which is a shame. Um, but it's USB, so you don't necessarily have to use this. You could plug in an Xbox 360 controller. No, you can't. I tried. It didn't work. In fact, um, I, they say it's compatible with various different controllers. I couldn't find anything that worked on it except a PlayStation 4 pad, inexplicably plugged in via the micro USB, which did work fine, but the 
well, I say it worked fine, that's a lie, to be honest with you. It worked fine as a thing, but um, you couldn't really redefine the buttons, and the buttons just didn't seem to work, and it was, frankly, uh, pretty much completely useless, which is a real shame. Um, yeah, the USB thing is a bit of a problem, frankly. You kind of need three, because you need the joystick in to navigate the menu to select the games, which makes sense. Um, then you could have, say, you know, your keyboard in there as well, that's good. Um, you're probably not going to be buying another one of these two-player games, because, you know, they're a bit shitey. Now, the problem comes, if you want to play a game that isn't one of the 64 built-in ones, oh yes, you can load in your own, um, I was going to say ROMs, tape image. Actually, it's technically, I think these use only the D64 disk images. You have to plug it in on a USB flash drive, and leave the flash drive plugged in the whole time. So now you've only got keyboard or joystick, which is annoying. So I thought, well, that's all right, because, um, you know, you don't really need the keyboard for most... Oh, no, no, you need to use the keyboard to load the game off the flash drive. <sighs> OK, this is getting awkward. It takes forever with the on-screen one. So I thought, well, what I shall do is I shall have a USB keyboard plugged in. Instantly, it seems to work with any USB keyboard, even wireless ones. Worked with all of them fine. So, because I... Oh God, this was such a pain in the ass, right? So, <clears throat> put in the keyboard, loaded the game, took the keyboard out to plug the joystick in, went back to the main menu! Hooray! Uh, what you need is a powered USB hub, which I did go and find up in the end, and that worked fine, but it's all a bit of a faff. It would have been nicer to have an extra one on there, because, frankly, the 64 games included are not the best, which we shall come on to later, so you probably are going to be wanting to load your own ones in at some point. Now, here's a question. What's inside this bloody thing? Is it a Raspberry Pi or something, you're asking? Is it running Android? Well, I'll quickly answer the second part. It's not running Android. It appears to be running some form of Linux. Um, and it is running, I believe, the Vice emulator for Commodore 64 games. Now, um, you may notice this does look familiar. If you have seen this design before, you may have seen it in the direct television Commodore 64 devices they had, that you literally just plugged straight into your telly and everything was on here, which had a C64 on a chip inside. Um, but it's nothing like that. No, nope, this is actually a computer running an emulator. And it's not a Raspberry Pi or something. It is its own custom hardware. I shall now, in fact, jump cut to having opened it up to show you. So, I've done some screw removal, and I had to remove the rubber uh, little feet pads first, obviously. And inside is... not a lot! Because, you know, in these days of mobile technology, why would there be? Um, in fact, there's actually little um, lumps in here to weigh it down, which is astonishing. But yes, here it is, a fully custom thing. A20, look, it even says on the PCB... Uh, the 64 version 1.0. Just to prove... It is not just like a generic thing they've put in there. If you're wondering what the wires coming off it are, that's just the LED that shows you the power. That one is kind of a mystery button. Um, you would have to remove the silver sticker on the bottom in order to actually press it. And I don't know what it does. Um, I will assume some sort of... Uh, sort of debuggy, updatey button or something? I don't know. I couldn't work it out, so let's not worry about it, because, you know, you're not supposed to be pressing it in general. So there we go. It is its own thing. Although it must be said, if it's running an emulator, does it really matter if it's its own thing or if it's a Raspberry Pi? Because the outcome's going to be pretty much the same, I would have thought. Or is it? I don't know. I'm not an engineer. But you could possibly answer that question for me. And while you're at it, tell me where the hell I left my spare house keys. I've been looking for them for ages. Anyway, there is a problem with the whole being an emulation thing going on, and that is that there is a bit of input lag. So when you move your joystick, it's that little extra fraction of a second before something happens on screen, and that is not a good thing, especially when coupled with this horrifying uh, cheapy plastic monstrosity. Because, well, as we alluded to earlier, Commodore 64 games astonishingly difficult. Um, if you never came across the Commodore 64 back in the day, maybe you're too young. Maybe you hid under a rock at the uh, very mention of the name Commodore. It's the one with uh, quite chunky pixels in most graphic modes, um, so it makes it look somewhat distinctive from the other computers. Although what makes it look more distinctive, actually, is the slightly weird muted colour palette of pastely browns and greys it has, um, which means you can sort of immediately spot a Commodore 64 game. Also, amazing sound chip that sounds sort of really dirty and grungy and interesting. The SID chip. Um, one of my personal favourites of the sound of old computers.
But yeah, if you're not familiar with the games, well, if you didn't grow up with games on systems like this, you will find an awful lot of them very difficult to deal with. There are some real gems in there, do not get me wrong, but uh, this was the birth of um, video games in a way, because people, you know, could just write a game in their bedroom because having the computer was all you needed to make the games you know you didn't need a nintendo development kit or any bullshit like that and also some of this stuff really does go back to 1983 1984 very very early days so do bear that in mind anyway let's look at some captured footage so you can see what it looks like and i'll talk over it for you so, the main menu is an attractive carousel system, much like the ones Nintendo have used, spoiled slightly by what looks like a system font for the descriptions. Uh, there's a nice piece of custom music in the background, at least I think it's custom, don't remember hearing it before. Downside, of course, is that it can take a while to scroll through to the game you want. The games themselves look great, nice and clear and crisp, and the sound seems spot on too. I should point out the sound cuts out for a second every so often in this recording, but that is a problem with my capture card, and the C64 Mini itself is absolutely fine. Uh, I've tried it on various televisions and monitors, and it works perfectly with all of them. There are options for CRT emulation, etc., but predictably they're just some blurry scan lines, and they all look rubbish. As previously stated, there's full access to C64 Basic, which, incredibly, is the only way to load your own games. It is really laborious. You have to put a single disk image with a very specific file name on a USB memory stick. Yes, you can only put a single game on each memory stick, unless you bugger about and do some custom disk imaging or something. Then you have to go into Basic, tell it to access the disk drive, which it has mapped to the USB stick, bring up a directory listing, and then tell it which file to run. I cocked it up here by forgetting how Commodore 64 disk images work, but I got it right the second time. See, this footage is sped up, but as you can see, using the virtual keyboard, which you have to do unless you have a USB hub, is a proper faff. I think it's pretty clear that people without technical knowledge are going to stick with the inbuilt games. The manufacturers say they're working on an update which will allow much easier access to multiple disk images, but that doesn't exist at the time of making this video. Anyway, eventually I got Sanxian up and running, and after all these years, I am still shit at it. So, let's get on to the 64 included games. I mean, they're all listed here, and as you can see, there are indeed 64 of them. Now, obviously, I haven't played all of them and I couldn't tell you what they're like. Oh, wait a minute, I'm Ashens. Alley Cat! A sort of fast vertically scrolling cross between a racing game to shoot them up, not actually much fun to play, and some levels you could like shoot a clear path through it and then just keep flying straight till you finish the race. Not great, to be honest, looks pretty though. Anarchy! Interesting action puzzler, good first, it gets stale very quickly. Armor Light Complete Edition, I don't know what Complete Edition means, but um, it was a really good horizontal shooter, excellent, in fact. I would argue it could be the best on the Commodore 64, and there are some bloody good shooters on the C64. Avenger, that was a ninja-based gauntlet clone. Uh, it's not bad, but it's not as good as Druid. If you want a gauntlet clone, go for Druid. Battle Valley, very pretty side-scrolling game where you control both a tank and a helicopter. Um, I remember it being a bit dull, to be honest, a bit dull and empty. Boulder Dash, as we said before, classic puzzle game. I preferred Repton on the Acorn personally, but hey, that's just me. Bounder, right, this is a really odd game where you control like a ball and have to very precisely control where it bounces, and I mean very precisely. Uh, it's kind of nearly great, but I don't know, far too bloody difficult to the point of annoyance, to be honest with you, and I always felt it was overrated as a result. California Games, as we said earlier, absolutely classic party game. Loads of uh, weird little sub-games based around surfing and hacky sack and BMX and stuff like that. Good fun with your mates. Look, there's a picture of the bit where you go on a skateboard. Chips Challenge. Oh, Chips Challenge, right. Uh, this is a superb puzzle game, absolutely superb. It's huge on the Atari Lynx, which is where I played it. I think there was like a Windows re-release or something on Steam a few years ago, but Chips Challenge is great, and C64 version perfectly good. Uh, Confusion, um, yeah, fiddly pipe mania style puzzle game, it's okay, you're not getting much fun out of it. Creatures, as I said earlier, is like a super high quality platform, I don't know, a bit kind of stodgy playing it. Uh, Creatures 2 is just much, much better. It's pointless to have this while Creatures 2 exists, it's a real shame they 
couldn't get it on here for whatever reason. I mean, I'm assuming the reason certain games aren't on here, to be honest, is licensing. Um, licensing this old stuff is a bloody nightmare because a lot of times nobody knows if the bloody game or who even owns the game anymore. You know, the records have been lost to time and therefore you cannot get them and stick them on your machine because you can't get the legal say-so because it just can't be done. So there's probably some reason like that, which is why Creatures 2 isn't on there. And you also realise that's why there's nothing like... Um, uh, arcade conversions or games based on movies and that kind of stuff because it's just not going to be licensed. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, Cyberdyne Warrior, that's... Ooh, that's like a platform shooter with a really small sprite, if I remember. Really tiny sort of main character. It was okay, but you're not going to get much fun out of it these days, to be honest. Cybernoid. Oh, yeah. Cybernoid the Fighting Machine. Didn't know it's called the Fighting Machine. Um, that was sort of an interesting maze-based uh, shooter with a little spaceship. Uh, got too quick, difficult too quick, if I remember, which is a common fault with these games. Cybernoid 2 The Revenge. Um, right, that was the same. Pretty much, but even more bloody difficult, if I remembered, and just wasn't kind of any fun as a result of that. Um, Deflector. Oh, man. Classic theme tune. One of my absolute favourite theme tunes to anything in any media, Deflector. Um, yeah, decent puzzle game. Um, you like reflecting beams of light. To be honest, I don't remember it holding my interest for that long, but first few levels were fun, and you can just listen to the theme over and over. Everyone's a Wally. Now, this fascinates me, because this... This was very much more of a thing on the spectrum. It's a very good arcade adventure, but a bit overly fiddly by today's standards. I don't know. I think the game before it was better. I'm trying to remember, was it Pajama Rama before? Oh, I can't remember anyway. Fire Lord, uh, one of these slightly obtuse um, adventure games. It always feels a bit empty. Um, it got really high marks on the spectrum. I always felt it was overrated. Looks a little bit like Robin of the Wood. Um, remember, there's a weird um, sort of sub game where you could steal things from people and they're looking the other way, which was interesting, but I don't know. Didn't add that much to the game at the end of it. Gribbly's Day Out. What a name. Uh, yeah, so speaking of overrated things. <laughs> <laughs> right, this is a platform with a really weird control system. Took ages to learn. When you do, the game gets stupidly difficult. A few levels in! Yeah, it's that problem again. Hawkeye. I fucking hate Hawkeye, right? It's fairly pretty, but incredibly dull platform shooter. It just does not stand up these days at all. And I didn't like it much at the time. I remember being quite unimpressed with it. Uh, there was an Amiga version, which I remember was worse. I actually looked prettier, but didn't play as well. Uh, Heartland. Oh, they right. Really nice arcade adventure. Um... There was a problem with Heartland that I now can't put my finger on. It was really sort of whimsical and interesting feel. Time limit. It was ruined by the time limit, Heartland, because you just didn't have enough time to bloody, you know, play the game and do the stuff. And frankly, there was no need for it to have a time limit anyway, really. Herobotics. A very average shoot-em-up. Fun for a few minutes. Herobotics was a budget... There's a lot of bloody budget games in here. Games that were released for, like, £2 in 1985. I don't know, we're... They're not going to stand up that well these days, are they, in general? There's always a few classics, don't get me wrong. Highway Encounter. Uh, that's like a weird action game. Uh, Commodore 64 version has very messy graphics, but still a lot of fun, if I recall. Um, a bit glitchy, if I remember, yeah. Yeah, I, I think, to be honest, if you want to play Highway Encounter, get the Spectrum version, or maybe the Amstrad version. I haven't played the Amstrad version to know, but, um, yeah, it's all right, but not the best version of that. Hunter's Moon, right, uh, this was really good. It's like a free-scrolling shoot 'em up go in any direction kind of thing. Um, it was spoiled, because as soon as one thing hit you, you died. That's it. Game over. Made the later levels just bloody stupid and annoying. Hysteria, right. Platforming sort of shoot 'em up set in like Greek times. I never really liked this. Um, I always felt it repetitive and entry. I mean, it does uh, repetitive and entry? I always felt it, it was a repetitive entry into the series. No, um, sort of repetitive and empty, which is what I was trying to say. Um, and my friend uh, Phil had it on Spectrum. The Spectrum version seemed a bit better. I remember he quite liked it. I don't know. It has its fans, but it never did anything for me. Impossible mission. Now we're talking, guys. Proper C64 classic. Platform based. It explore them up? <laughs> I don't know, really. It's great. Anyway, it's fucking great, Impossible Mission, and it's different enough from Impossible Mission 2 uh, to warrant the inclusion of both, I would personally have said. So, uh, yeah, full marks for that. IO? IO? Um, that was another horizontal shooter. Very difficult. Oh, Jumpman. Right. Jumpman is a really early game. Really early. We're talking sort of 1983. Uh, all that sort of level. Actually, don't quote me on that, but it's really early. And it looks super primitive. In fact, it's a very primitive game, full stop. But 
it's great. It's just still really good fun to this day. It's just like a really good arcadey game with a nice core to it. Mega Apocalypse, uh, that was a very odd game. Very sort of frenetic uh, level-based shoot 'em up where you shot into the screen. Um, again, very difficult, um, but it pulled it off well. And it was a lot of fun, that, if I remember, yeah. Mission AD. God, I can't remember. Uh... Mission AD. Oh, that was the platform shooter where you just run too bloody quickly and everything's a bit too fast. It was a bit crap, I thought. Again, has its fans, but um, no, it always reminds me of an obscure Electron game that I've never been able to track down. Monty Mole! Monty Mole! Very famous on the ZX Spectrum. Uh, it's a very old platform game, and it absolutely fucking does not hold up these games days. This should not be on here. It's just it's so primitive and early and not really any fun. And there's no reason for it to be on here when you've got Monty on the run which is far better. It's a sequel. Um, or was it the sequel? Was there another one in between? Where did Elf Weeder say in Monty Gum? I can't remember. But yeah, Monty on the Run is far, far, far better. There's just no reason for Monty Mole to be on here, which you're not going to have any fun with when you can totally have some fun with Monty on the Run. That's my new catchphrase. Have some fun with Monty on the Run. Nebulous. Yeah, we mentioned that earlier. It's got a really pretty, pa uh, pretty tower spinning mechanic, but I never liked it. Never liked it. All the way. In fact, to be honest, I kind of hated it. It's just so boring and empty. It's like the game is almost non-existent. I had it on the Atari ST and just never did anything for me. Netherworld! Um, weird cross between a shoot -em up and Boulder Dash uh, is my best description of that. And it didn't quite work, frankly. It wasn't awful, but I'm not really going to have much fun with it. Nobby the Aardvark! That was a Thalamus, if I recall. Um, as in, from the people, Thalamus, not part of somebody's brain. A really, really pretty platform game. Uh, fun to play for a bit. There uh, wasn't much life in it, if I remember. It just didn't quite... Again, just didn't quite have the playability to that one. Nodes of Yezod. Yeah, as I mentioned up above, sort of pretty classic platform adventure. Again, something else I would... Uh sort of put more with the spectrum in my mind but yeah it was a good one you need some patience to sort of enjoy it i think because there's a lot of sort of falling and getting vaguely stuck places but it's a solid game and um, i think you can still have some fun with that these days paradroid oh hang on oh my back <laughs> oh sorry i'm leaning over to read all these and oh that was actually quite painful um paradroid yes uh absolute classic exploration game incredibly bland graphics like really sort of just grey and nothingy um, but absolutely do give it a chance it is really really good fun um, although I'm going to come with a controversial hot take it's not as good as Quasatron on the ZX Spectrum yeah, which is like a sort of monochrome version monochrome um, isometric version it was monochrome because it was a Spectrum but um, yeah and it sort of had a little bit more to it but anyway pit stop two man one of the very few into the screen racing go whoop, whoop, whoop. uh one of the very few into the screen racing games on the c64 that isn't shite frankly um trying to think about the good ones buggy boy was good uh super cycle was good super cycle is on here if i remember actually yeah it's a bit dull in one player mode two player mode absolutely fantastic the problem is you're probably not going to be playing it in two player mode but there we go um ranorama doon 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 ranorama doon 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 doo 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 there we are that's how the intro went in atari st this is a great game um i'm a very much a proponent of ranorama it's shockingly ugly on Commodore 64 like it's a problem how ugly it is it's actually hard to see what's going on but it's still a really clever game but to be honest if you want to play it get the Atari ST or Amiga versions and emulate them and play those because you're going to have a lot more fun with it Robin of the Woods yeah pretty dull exploration games I said earlier horribly overrated by Zap 64 magazine yeah you might get a bit of fun out of it but frankly I bloody doubt it uh, Rubicon oh Rubicon Right, Rubicon, a platform shooter similar to Hawkeye. Felt like a kind of rip-off of Hawkeye, but even prettier. Um, still pretty crap to play, though, to be honest. Great music, great graphics, everything else. Mwah. Skate Crazy! Um, very average sort of skating game. The controls took ages to master, and to be honest, weren't really worth it. I would, I would say don't bother. School Days, right. Oh, man, this is such a unique game. Conversion of the Spectrum game, of us, it's, it's a really hard one to describe. It's like a, I don't know, a late 70s British school simulator. It's kind of fussy and weird, but it's just really unique and really good fun. The problem is, there's a much, much superior sequel, Back to School, that was never converted to the Commodore 64. I mean, I'll be honest, if you want to play that game, you are much better off emulating the Spectrum version of the sequel there, because it's just a better game all round. Snare! 
Snare. Oh, I'm trying to remember what the hell Snare was. That was a Thalamus game, if I recall. One of the better spaceship shooters, wasn't it? Hmm. <sighs> Hmm. I'm, I can't remember anything specific about it, and that's not a good sign, is it? Um, hmm. No, there's a spaceship shooter. It'll be pretty. It'll be very competent because it's Thalamus, but it's a bit unmemorable because I can't remember even what it looks like. Speedball? No! Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa, that was dangerous. Need to drop me a new camcorder. I've only had it five minutes. Speedball, yeah, utterly pointless, to be honest. Utterly, utterly pointless inclusion because Speedball 2 is much better in all respects. Um, Speedball is just pointless on here next to Speedball 2. Speedball 2, Brutal Deluxe. Oh, man, I'd forgotten that was the subtitle. Um, yeah, really amazing future sports game. I would say probably the best future sports game of all time, but... This ain't the version you want to be playing. Again, you want the Atari ST or the Amiga version, really. Amiga CD32 version and AGA versions being the best, if I remember, because it was easier to tell between the teams. I don't know, it was a long time ago, but yeah. Hmm. I mean, C64 version's all right, but do the game justice and, you know, play one of the better ones, I think. Spin Dizzy. As I said before, Marvel Madness. Sorry, Marble Madness, but... Yeah, just too difficult. Never saw the appeal of it, frankly. Star Paws! Right. Very strange game where you play like a cartoon dog and you're trying to catch a kind of space road runner on a weird planet. It's not great, to be honest, but uh, there's an interesting story behind it. The game was originally called Attack of the Mutant Zombie Flesh Eating from the Blah. I'm going to have to start this again. Attack of the Mutant Zombie Flesh Eating Chickens from Mars starring Zappo the Dog. Yes, I did do that from memory because I got obsessed with the uh, adverts for it in Fla uh, Crash magazine. Um, it was never released under that title, obviously, and it was originally come up with by Matthew Smith, who had made Jet Set Willy and Manic Miner and all those famous games. But yeah, sadly, it came out as Star Paws and not Attack of the Mutant Zombie Flesh Eating Chickens from Mars, starring Zappo the Dog. Steel, a really beautiful exploration shooter um, where the robots were ripoffs of the ones from the Black Hole, you know, Vincent and all that stuff, um, as in the Black Hole movie, the old Disney one that nobody really remembers. Very basic gameplay, um, weren't much fun at all if I remember to be honest. Street Sports Baseball, I like that, it's a sort of decent baseball game with kids playing in a field. Yeah, it's okay, um, I don't know, I, I quite enjoyed the aesthetic of it not being professionals playing it, I quite like the street sports things for those reasons, but I remember it being quite a good version. Summer Games 2 with Summer Games 1, now we are fucking talking guys, right, these are great, they are, it's a superb inclusion, these are fantastic party games, absolutely fantastic, right, loads of little multi games of all the different, you know, summer events and that for the Olympics, you can just pass the joystick around, play with friends, top fun, superb idea. Super Cycle, uh, this is uh, I mentioned this earlier, actually. It's a screen racing game, except it's got bikes in it. It's like, hang on, really? It's, it's fine. We ran all right. It's fine. I can't say much else, really. Temple of Apshai Trilogy. Right. Man, uh, very basic looking, but surprisingly in-depth RPG. Um, it's very clunky by today's standards. If you get into it, it will eat your time. But to be honest, it's unlikely you will get into it because there's so many superior versions created over the years now. The Ark of Yezod. Didn't realise that was on there. That's the sequel to Nodes of Yezod. How the hell did I miss that? I went through all these. Um, yeah, Ark of Yezod. <laughs> is my noise for that. So it's a sequel to Nodes of Yezod, but from what I remember of it, it's basically the same game, but not as fun. Totally pointless inclusion, to be honest with you. Thing on a Spring! Very highly regarded game. God, people went on about this for years. I never liked it at all, right, because there were always bloody enemies that couldn't be avoided. Um, they'd just get, like, stuck to your character and you lose all your bloody health and that. I don't know. <sighs> It just made it unfair. Didn't like it. It's an unfair game. A pox on bloody thing on a spring. Then there's Thing Bounces Back. Yes, that's the sequel. It's an inferior sequel. That's just too bloody difficult overall. Uh, Trailblazer. Trailblazer. Oh, man, right. Into the screen, you control a bouncing ball on, like, a checkerboard. Uh, it's good fun for a few minutes. Bit of a pointless inclusion, though, because Trail... Ooh, Cosmic Causeway, Trailblazer 2, I never knew it was called that. Um, yeah, Trailblazer 2 is essentially the same game, but like they fixed some of the problems and it was better. So, yeah, don't really get that. Uchi Martina, this is a rare thing. A judo game. Had a clever control system, uh, took a while to figure out. Yeah, it's kind of fun. I can't remember anything else really playing like it, to be honest with you. Then we've got Iridium, one of the iconic C64 games. Still really fun today. 
Um, as I'd said before, really sort of very fast horizontal shooter with uh, really clever ideas for movement. Uh, Uridium 2 on the Amiga is also worth a look if uh, you happen to be into such things. Who Dares Wins 2? Man, I remember I had a friend who was really keen on this on the uh, Amstrad. It's a really nice Commando clone. In fact, for my money, I would say it's better than the uh, much beloved Commodore 64 version of Commando. It's not as pretty, but I think it's more fun to play. And then Winter Games and World Games. Yes, <clears throat> same as Summer Games, really. Loads of fun little sports mini games. Excellent inclusion. Yeah, fantastic. And World Games, I said, exactly the same. In fact, I would say World Games may be the best of the games games. Certainly the ones on here. And that's saying something. It's all fucking great. And then finally, Zynapse. Zynapse, crappy shoot 'em up, no restart points, your ship had weird inertia, didn't like it. I, I actually did like the ZX Spectrum version, but the Commodore 64 one is a bit shite. I mean, it's a shame, because we are missing so many classics. Where's IK+, Plus? where's Archon, where's Turrican and Turrican 2, where's bloody, I mean, Bubble Bobble, well, I know it's an arcade game, you're not going to get that, where's Prince of Persia, where's Maniac Mansion, where's, where's Bruce Lee, Bruce Lee was, oh, you'd have to get the... Bruce Lee's estate to agree to it, I suppose. And where's the great Guyana sisters? Where's the last ninja? It's a Commodore 64. Where's the last ninja and last ninja 2? Where's Bionic Granny? Okay, I'm joking. That one's awful. Anyway, my back is killing me and my voice has given out because I wasn't expecting to talk so much. So I'm going to jump cut there. So that is the C64 Mini. It's a pretty little thing, but who is it aimed at? Because um, with the crap controller and the input lag and the fact that it would crash occasionally when I was playing things, um, it's not really going to be something for the hard hardcore C64 gaming person. They're just going to emulate it, or possibly even be playing it on the old original hardware, because the emulation, frankly, is going to give them a better experience, and also a much wider range of games. It seems to be aimed at somebody who remembers the C64 or is interested in it, and just wants something easy to plug into the telly, and away they go. But they're not going to get the best experience, because at the moment... You're not really going to be having the best games on it, are you? And the controller's a bit crap and, you know... Bleh. But, you know, they may fix, like, the multi-game stuff with uh, firmware upgrades in the future, but is the casual guy who just wants to plug it into the telly going to be the same person who is going to update the firmware? Probably not. It's a bit of a shame, really. Um, it, it just isn't quite there. Yes, to be honest, it's because it's so pretty. Maybe it's just something for displaying on the shelf, because um, it is better to emulate. So you've got no lag, and you're not using that bloody thing. So, uh, well. But hey, if in the future they can sort out the multi-game stuff, they can widen the uh, amount of controllers that work with it and remove the input lag, then this will be a good thing indeed. And hey, it could happen, but it ain't there yet, I'm afraid. Subscribe for more.